Well, I thought Kathy McMorris Rogers did a great job. I, I have prepared remarks uh, today, uh, but but also uh, looking out over the crowd, um, I see everybody looking down at their devices, uh, and and uh, you know it's hard to uh, hard to drum up any sympathy for Congress these days. But I hope you do appreciate that we're now six days into the impeachment trial, and when we're in trial, we can't use these things um, on the Senate floor. Does everybody appreciate that? Uh, there have been no convulsions that I know of. Uh, uh, no senator has fallen out in the aisle and, and uh, just uh, gone into delirium tremens. Uh, so, you know, give us a little love because... Uh, when that gavel comes in and and the Chief Justice uh, walks in, we have uh, eschewed these for, for uh, I guess now this will be the seventh day to wish us well. Uh, the Internet, uh, I'm, I'm one of six keynote speakers. Oh, okay, wow. Okay. Uh, look, the Internet's strong. The Internet's open. You know, that's free to Americans. We need to keep it that way. I want to talk about four specific issues, uh, and then I do have to, to run back uh, and, and try to, uh, to uh, check into two committees so I can get my, my uh, per diem in both those committees. Um, net neutrality. Uh, and, and really, you know, Kathy did such a great job talking about all those. Accurate broadband maps, winning the race to 5G, and federal data privacy legislation, something I have spent a lot of time on. On oh, net neutrality. Uh, last year, I formed a bipartisan working group with Senator Sinema on uh, the open internet. Our efforts have been focused on developing legislation that would create uniform rules of the road for all internet companies. The internet developed rapidly under the Clinton administration. When I was a freshman, in Congress, we were learning how to use the World Wide Web. It developed rapidly, continued uh, to revolutionize during the Bush administration. What was the key there? Both of those uh, administrations, we used the light touch regulatory regime, paving the way for the world we are now entering. As we assess where we stand decades later, we should remember how we got to where we are today. As digital innovation continues to leap forward, the dynamic and creative nature of the Internet should be encouraged, not discouraged, by over-regulation. So what happened in 2015? The FCC adopted rules that unfortunately increased costs for Americans and American businesses. And what happened? Investment in broadband actually decreased by 4 billion dollars in the year after these rules went into effect. The rest of the economy was taken off. Investment in broadband decreased by four billion dollars. Check us out on the facts there. In 2018, the new FCC reverse course went back to the light touch rules of the Clinton and Bush administrations, and many were worried that these changes would hurt Americans' access to the internet uh, in fact, more Americans have been connected to fiber and investment has increased. Simply put, the parade of horribles predicted by advocates of Title II regulation simply have not occurred. That's why we need to continue rules to ensure that the Internet remains powerful, a powerful economic engine promotes future investment, and protects consumers by preventing blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization of lawful internet traffic. Through the Wicker Cinema working group process, it's been, become clear that there is more agreement on this issue than you might think. Most of us would agree that any legislative proposal should protect consumers, increase transparency, promote broader access to internet services, and ensure that content from different sources is treated fairly. I think we're making great progress there. Let's talk about accurate broadband maps. 
I think this is a situation where the Congress is moving, but also we've turned the FCC around on this issue. Accurate broadband maps, as Kathy McMorris Rogers just says, are a critical component to closing the digital divide and maintaining a prosperous internet economy. We need accurate broadband maps that tell us where the broadband is available and where it is not available at certain speeds. Flawed and inaccurate maps, which were just about to be foisted on us, would have wasted resources and stifled opportunities. So last year, I introduced the Broadband Data Act, which requires the FCC to change the way broadband data is collected, verified, and reported to the agency. As many of you know, this has passed the United States Senate. It awaits passage in the House, and I, for one, would sure like to get that bill on the president's desk early this year. Now, your previous uh, panelists talked about winning the race to 5G, and we've got to do that. Um, uh, healthcare providers um, in um, Mississippi have been innovative um, in reaching hard to reach patients and constituencies. University of Mississippi Medical Center can extend the reach of life saving telemedicine and support more cutting edge medical services. As a result, Mississippians and others around the country will enjoy increased access to better quality of care at lower cost and in remote locales. If we can uh, win the race to 5G, our farms and ranches, uh, 5G will enable the use of more precision agriculture technologies. The benefits of 5G will also extend to manufacturing, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other next generation innovation. For example, because 5G infrastructure will support significantly more data and near real-time connections, the manufacturing sector can increase efficiencies through automation in factories and supply chains. You know all of this, and you know that we need to win the race to 5G, and that question is up in the air. But achieving U.S. leadership in 5G will require a dedicated and coordinated effort at all levels of the government, and this starts with making more spectrum available. Again, I endorse the comments of my friend and colleague, Kathy McMorris Rogers. The, um, the challenge is this mid-band spectrum. My position is that Congress should speak on this issue, House and Senate, and the President should sign legislation into law. Barring that, uh, I think we all know the FCC is preparing to act and is ready to act quickly. So if Congress would like to be heard, um, left, right, and center, Republican and Democrat, we need to act, and we need to act now because the FCC knows that speed is of the essence if we are to win the race to 5G. Uh, also, I have legislation which I uh, 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 have given the shorthand of rip and replace, and that, it, that deals with uh, another issue that your last panel talked about, and that is the Huawei and ZTE equipment in our networks. This underscores the importance of safeguarding our communications networks from threats to our national economic and personal security. We're not quite there on passing that legislation, as you might imagine. There are um, a number of views on that, but sure would be nice. And then uh, my favorite issue, for 2019 that I've spent so much sweat uh, equity on, and that is federal data privacy legislation. Uh, consumer trust is essential. To maintain trust, a strong uniform federal data privacy framework should adequately protect consumer data from misuse. Here I am sticking to my script because I want to choose my words carefully. For the past year, I've been working with my colleagues on the Commerce Committee to develop a strong national and bipartisan privacy law that would provide meaningful data protections for all Americans. Late last year, 
Democrats on the Commerce Committee introduced legislation clearly reflecting where they want to go. This was a pretty good bill. However, any privacy bill will need bipartisan support to become law. From the beginning of this process, I have advocated for privacy legislation that would provide strong protections for consumers and create a uniform federal data privacy framework. A national uniform data privacy framework. Strong privacy protections need to apply to consumers regardless of where in the United States they live, work, or engage in commerce, both online and offline. A privacy bill will also need to be workable for businesses and foster an environment that continues to promote job creation, investment, and innovation. I also released a bill late last year that is intended to achieve those objectives. My draft bill is informed by over a year of bipartisan negotiations and feedback we have received from consumer advocates, state and local governments, academia, and a number of stakeholders representing many sectors of the economy. I am continuing to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to get a bill that will get us across the finish line. So um, those four issues are, are uh, front and center in our committee and, and in my consciousness. Um, and I think we are making great progress. In the meantime, uh, the Internet continues to be that great engine of job creation and economic uh, growth. Maintaining a commitment to legislative ideas that promote investment, protect consumers, and foster innovation will help drive continued technology, leadership, and economic prosperity in the United States for years to come. Thank you, and have a good Super Bowl.